Hey everybody, Joe here from the Lions Led by Donkeys podcast. If you enjoy what we do here on the show and you think it's worth your hard-earned money, you can support the show via Patreon. Just a $1 donation gets you access to bonus episodes, our Discord, and regular episodes before everybody else. If you donate at an elevated level, you get even more bonus content. A digital copy of my book, The Hooligans of Kandahar, and a sticker from our Teespring store. Our show will always be ad-free and is totally supporter-driven. We use that money to pay our bills, buy research materials that make this show possible, and support charities like the Kurdish Red Crescent, the Flint Water Fund, and the Halo Trust. Consider joining the Legion of the Old Crow today. And now back to the show. Hello, and welcome to yet another episode of the Lions Up by Donkeys podcast. I am Joe, and with me still is Liam. Hello, Liam. Hi, Joe. How you feeling, bud? I have stitches in my mouth, Joe. I was uh, thinking that uh, we might be able to postpone this episode, but I looked over our podcast collective bargaining agreement. You actually don't legally have any days off. Mm. When you're not recording, you actually have to uh, go to the coal mine that we purchased uh, uh, yes. and just hack at the wall. We don't need coal. We just oh. need you to hack at the walls a little bit. Ah, they would say a digging enterprises. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It only exists to give you black lung and employ at least three West Virginians. <laughs> <laughs> I got to hit the vape out of another side of my mouth now. <laughs> God, that can't feel good <laughs> at stitches. No. You're going to have to hit the vape through the nose. Nostril vape. <laughs> or you could boof it. <laughs> Damn it, Joe. <laughs> Get a Garfield that vape. <laughs> See, this is why we cover black lung, because listen to you. I'm dying. <laughs> now. <laughs> My tummy hurts. <laughs> All right, I'm here. I'm ready. Let's do a podcast. So when we left you last time. I was still alive. Liam had not yet died of black vape lung, and I don't know how much was left in by our long-suffering producer, Nate. My dogs kept interrupting. Shut the fuck up! <laughs> I, I found out why. My neighbor got a dog, uh, and they could hear him through the walls, and I couldn't because I have headphones on. Ah. So that's going to be fun from here on out. But Greece got invaded, and uh, Italy and they got bit some guys. <laughs> yeah, they bit they bit some Italians. Uh, all all you can eat breadsticks were served in the Greek mountains, and <laughs> Nazi Germany had to kind of come to Mussolini. Daddy Hitler. Daddy Hitler had to go uh, help baby Mussolini. The situation of which I've created in my head, and I really hate. Yeah, I'm not pleased with what we've done here. <laughs> Story of my life, man. Now, since then, Hitler, exasperated at his idiot ally, had to get involved before Greece steamrolled through Albania and maybe Italy itself on a long enough timeline. There's a lot that could happen here. That would have been tight, I will say. That would have been funny. Uh, what is more realistic is that the British would have used Greece as a stepping off point right. to a future third front before you know the third front actually opened up. Mm -hmm. Now, Mussolini was so far up his own ass here. He wasn't quite sure how bad things were actually going because this might surprise you in a fascist dictatorship. His generals were not very open on the details. Oh, no? I mean, like when we talked about the chief of staff's journal last time, uh, he's like, you know, things are not going well. Il, Il Duce is mad. <laughs> like, <laughs> he's not telling him everything. He's like, no, the attack just failed. We don't need to tell you that, you know, we just fed another thousand Italians into a wood chipper in the mountains. I like, guess what we did. <laughs> right. Uh, so... He planned, and by he, I mean Mussolini himself, oh, planned boy. an Italian offensive to retake the southern parts of Albania that the Greeks had since advanced into. Notice how I say that Mussolini planned it. Now, there might be some people listening that know that Mussolini was, in fact, a military veteran of the First World War. He was not, however, any kind of high-ranking officer or had any kind of knowledge of operations planning. Oh, I can't believe Operation Gonna Go Fine didn't go fine. I mean, much like Hitler, uh, he was a pretty low rank. Like Hitler was a corporal. Right. And I think Mussolini was about the same. Um, and this actually gave uh, Hitler more than Mussolini, I think, a weird attitude where he didn't trust officers, which I can understand. Yeah, fair enough. As a, lower, <laughs> a former lower enlisted man myself. Uh, but 
what it did is fill him with a uh, like a fake overconfidence in his own abilities that he knew what the true soldier needed to do because he was a soldier or like a soldier sure why not they called him like uh front rats or something like that in german i don't know front and ratten what an unappealing language (laughs) they gave them this like mind palace of their own creation where where because they were uh, on the front lines they truly know what tactics are and you know Admittedly, I fall into this sometimes as well when I look at how stupid higher planning is and I realize like this isn't going to work. But I'm also doing that with a lot of foresight and reading 100 right. years in the future of when things occurred. However, they did this with like actually tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of lives. So I didn't do that. I got one up on them. I'm at least one step above Hitler. <laughs> yeah. Take that, you dead bitch. Congratulations, Chow. Yeah. See, when 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 you have your bar low, it's very easy to make yourself feel better. Oh, buddy, Bolt, I know it. Preach, brother. Now, Mussolini was planning this operation, and he planned it for spring, uh, which was the probably the best decision he made because it was, you know, better than winter in the mountains. But the reason why he did that was actually very stupid. Oh, boy. Uh, he believed that spring was, quote, an Italian season. What does that even mean? Because when you're a fascist, even the seasons have a race, I guess. I don't fucking know. What? What does that even mean, man? I don't know. Now, he decided he was going to plan this and it lead it. It's Italian season. Shouldn't you do it in the spring? It's Italian seasoning, which means it comes with parsley and some other green stuff on top. But you'd figure, is it the season for victory or somebody and shit? You know, for someone that was uh, a bit of a demagogue, he's not good at speaking. No. Uh, maybe it sounds better than the original Italian. I don't fucking know. Uh, he decided that he would lead and command this from the front and not like okay. what we all we all dream this would be where like Mussolini would strap on a harness of like full of ammo and grab a rifle and run his waddle his short fat ass at the front of the Italian mm-hmm. lines. Instead, he dressed himself in his marshal's uniform, a rank that he was uh, given. And uh, he assumed that the, you know, he... Tacky bitch. I mean, yeah, of course. This is a guy that put his literally a 3D cutout of his face on a building, surrounded by the word C. Yes, right? <laughs> like, yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes, yes. The worst version of Daniel Bryan ever made. Um, it's the wrestling joke for the one person yeah, who, right. who gets it. <laughs> but he, he assumed that he, the champion of the Italian people, was cutting an impressive figure that would inspire the most, mostly freezing Italians that have been stuck in this shit in Albania for months now when he... Yeah, all right, Gumpy. Yeah, it didn't work. Um, something to be right. said to the credit of Italian soldiers, they didn't even like play this game. Because he figured out pretty soon after getting to the front that his soldiers are pretty much sick of him after being you know thrown into the mountains for the last couple months. We're almost a year at this point. He walked up to a soldier who was on a stretcher in obvious pain from a chest wound and announced, quote, I am El Duce and I bring you the greetings of the fatherland. Oh. And what has to be one of the greatest, like... Just give me more, enough morphine to kill me at that point, man. <laughs> the the best Italian passive aggressiveness I've ever heard. I don't know if Italians like are, like have a passive aggressive sense of humor, but the soldier looked at him. The dictator of Italy that could literally have him executed the drop of a hat and said, quote, well, now, isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, dickhead. Yeah. Well, cool. I hope you get shrapnel in the chest, too, you piece of shit. Uh, but as funny as that is, Mussolini wasn't actually at the front to inspire his soldiers, who he really seemed to hate at this point. Because remember, he said that like freezing to death was good for them at one point. Right. That builds morale, goddammit. He instead popped a chair open and literally watched his new offensive begin on the sidelines like a sports event. Oh my uh, god. What a dick. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, this is pretty common, like, uh, back in the day, like, during the Civil War and, like, even the yep. Franco-Prussian War, people, like, just popped chair. And unfortunately, like, the Syrian Civil War, people would, like, I think uh, Israelis would, like, go to the border and just watch it. Um, and from, like, the Turkish border as well. War tourism, but you're Mussolini. Yeah. From his observation post, Mussolini watches his artillery fired 100,000 shells in two hours to open the Italian d- offensive on the central Albanian front on March 9th, 1941. Then 50,000 Italians began advancing against only 28,000 Greeks along a 20-mile front 
between Osum and Oos rivers, something I'm sure I pronounced correctly. My Albanian is actually flawless. Many people don't know this. (laughs) Well, you are from Albania, as we know. Yeah, of course. Well, at least I can joke about it now. Oh, it's just canon at this point. (laughs) It's canon across three podcasts. I've got it. This happened in Will There's Your Problem and Trash Future, uh, where Milo Edwards told me to uh, like meet him in a bunker or something like that. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's great stuff all around. Love it. Now, uh, the Greeks were, as I said, outnumbered and outgunned, and they still forced the Italians back. In many Hell occasions, yeah. the Greeks ran out of ammo again, stabbed the Italians with their bayonets, robbed them of their ammo, and then started shooting at them again. Nice. Good for that, man. Now, remember, Mussolini's watching all of this. If watching his army get wrecked wasn't bad enough, uh, some Greek bomber aircraft very nearly killed Mussolini as they came. Oh, it's so close. I know. It's one of those situations that, like, uh, if you were only, like, a few feet. just aimed a little higher, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It forced him to run for cover. Uh, where he apparently didn't take it too well. He was a bit panicky, which is not something I expected from someone who survived the front of World War I. Like, I expect better of you, Mussolini. <laughs> you, you've gone soft, but Nito. Yeah. Now, he stayed at the front ordering attack after attack for 11 full days before finally getting sick of watching constant failure and then went back to Rome. Oh, okay. But that did not mean that he called off the attack. He simply allowed it to continue on when he was gone. A noble. Yeah, five days after he went back to Rome and 12,000 casualties later, the Italians gave up. That's, that's the Italian way, as we've learned. War is hard, turns out. Through two world wars, uh, the one thing that is, that is true of the Italian army is they will throw themselves at the mountains until there's almost nothing left and then change sides. <laughs> <laughs> We love you, Italy. Now, if that was bad for Mussolini, it was even worse for Hitler. This finally made him fucking snap. He sent a letter to Rome a week later and said, quote, I now would cordially request you, Il Duce, not to undertake any further operations in Albania in the course of the next few days. Now, this is me kindly translating this to like not diplomatic things like stay the fuck out of the way. What are you doing, dude? Yeah. The reason why is because on Palm Sunday, April 6th, 1941, just like not that much longer uh, later, Hitler ordered ordered the invasion of Greece from Bulgaria while simultaneously invading Yugoslavia. Ah, there's a subtle dig there. If you remember from our last episode, uh, Mussolini claimed all of Yugoslavia. (laughs) It's like an older brother holding a basketball over someone's head. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's obvious tactical usage invading Yugoslavia if you're looking at it from the the side of the Nazis here. But there's also a lot to do with he knew what Mussolini wanted in his little Roman Empire 2.0 project. And it was a special fuck you to him for having to come and bail his stupid ass out. Because if he was going to invade Yugoslavia... Really Mussolini this up, huh? Really benito the shit out of this. Like, if he was going to invade Yugoslavia, he could have done it earlier. Or even later. I mean, he didn't have to do it simultaneously. Yugoslavia was not going to storm down into Greece and help. You know, sure. they had you know, their own self-defense to worry about here. This was actually kind of sort of morally and uh, very temporarily inspired the Greeks because they believed that the invasion uh, of, of Yugoslavia would inspire their Balkan neighbors to be forced to join the fight against the Nazis. Because remember... The Greeks and, the, and, their, and their neighbors have a bit of a history. Yeah. Uh, so they, they believe that like this opening of another front would divide the Germans up, which would make them maybe possible for the Yugoslavians to be able to defeat, or at least stalemate them, draw more material and people into it. Either or, there is some serious optimism here. That, like, finally, the, the, like, the Balkan League is getting the Our band friends. back together to kick out the Germans. But uh, unfortunately, the Germans yeah, blitzed no, straight through nice. Yugoslavia in a week. Um, yeah, yeah. Nice. yeah, Greek was left standing alone once again and probably like, how the fuck did that happen? God damn it. I mean, at this point, Greece is not necessarily underestimating the Germans, but they're like, well, we fuck it. We fucked up the Italians. How hard could the Germans be? Very. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it turns out you're, you're not fighting the B team of the Axis and you're fighting the Italians. You're, you're 
I don't know what's below like triple A baseball or that oh, it's like spring league. <laughs> yeah. The, so, so it's some fucking F league basketball or whatever. G league, G league. G league. Yeah. yeah. My bad. A Greek soldier wrote home to his family saying, quote, with our fingers on the trigger, we are following the movements of the enemy, expecting the ultimatum with the resolution to die with the certainty that we will show the Germans what it's like to be a free Greek. Badass. Uh, yeah. But they know they're going to their extinction. Yeah. I mean, they pretty much accepted that we're going to fucking lose, but we're going to turn this whole bitch into a graveyard for Germans. Now, the British knew the Germans were not going to be able to simply be brushed aside like the Italians kind of had been and right. w- warn the Greeks that maybe falling back and not holding this. So they, the Greeks had built uh, the so-called Metaxas line. Um, it was a 130 mile long series of concrete bunkers and fighting positions that cut through the eastern mountains. The British, who had been, you know, fighting Germany and Europe and kind of had seen how fixed defensive positions that were well mapped out by reconnaissance fared against the German invasion. Right. And pointed out that this is not going to work. We need to fall back deeper into Greece and fight them from a better position. Right. Or the Greeks ignored them because they're like, ah, worked against the Italians. Fuck them. (laughs) Yeah. Now, the problem was with Yugoslavia, the war, they could now be invaded from another direction, which exposed the flank of the Metaxas line. And because it was concrete bunkers and shit, you can't move to meet that threat. And uh, that's exactly what happened. The line only held for two days, um, falling to specially trained mountain troops, which would happen a lot. The Italians had the Alpinis, their special mountain troops, but they sucked. Uh, They were not actually very well trained in mountain warfare at all. Oh. So it doesn't do what it says on the tent, huh? Nah, uh, that's not something the Nazis had to worry about. Their mountain troops were pretty well trained at this point in the war. They hadn't been like hemorrhaged to death by Barbarossa. So like, right. they're, they're still very much there and very well trained and experienced. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, a German suicide freighter, uh, which was oh, like God. A, a ghost rided boat. Uh, loaded with 250 tons of TNT, crashed into the uh, Greek port of Pyranus, uh, which was the the main hub for British supplies, which were the Oof. only real supply for the Greek military at that point, and detonated. The blast completely ruined the port. Uh, it could be heard for 150 miles away. <laughs> Uh, it just completely turned into a moonscape afterwards. So that, that there's that's one supply line done. And then uh, a few days later, on April 9th, the second Panzer Division ruled unopposed into capture Greek's largest city, Salonika, uh, which is more than the Italians have been able to do in a year. Uh, so things, things are not going good two days in. <laughs> now, this advance and the fall of the Metaxas line left the full 70,000 Greek soldiers pinned against the eastern oh, coast. Uh, they had nowhere to go, uh, barely enough ammo to fight. They had no way of resupply. The, the British could not resupply them via air. Right. Uh, and at this point, it was pretty obvious that the officers were going to order the soldiers to surrender to spare them what is sure to be a massacre pinned against the coast. And when the generals ordered them to surrender, the, the soldiers actually refused for quite a while. Bless them. And uh, eventually they, they agreed to surrender. But that wasn't actually the case. A lot of soldiers said, fuck this, and just ran off into the mountains where they Good. would end up joining Good. the resistance. Good. Uh, one artillery major decided that he was not going to go out and surrender. He also happened to be of Jewish heritage. and He had a good feeling what was going to happen to him if should he mm-hmm. fall into captivity. So he uh, ordered his unit into formation, saluted them, bid them all goodbye, and then shot himself in the head. Oh, I'm sorry, man. And then his men broke out in the rendition of the Greek national anthem, Hymn to Freedom. And then they bit 90 Nazis, <laughs> fucked their lives. A lot of these guys end up running off and join the resistance uh, because after they fucked the Nazis' wives. They, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> we're going to we're going to drive all the way to Berlin, but not for the reasons that you think. <laughs> Here to liberate that puss. <laughs> now, after blowing Sorry. through the Metaxas line, <laughs> the only thing standing in the way of the German advance was the 6th Australian Division and the New Zealand Division. Oh, boy. There's also the 1st British Armored Brigade and three understrength Greek divisions. Very understrength at this point. Uh, mm-hmm. Remember Maitland or old Jumbo uh, dug these units in around uh, Mount Olympus, of all places. Uh, but, of course, found out again that digging in against the fast-moving enemy doesn't really work. They me- yeah, they immediately got outflanked and had to withdraw. 
uh, which was a better case. I mean, if he didn't withdraw, he was going to be surrounded and destroyed. Right. Now, obviously, the Greeks went from triumphant victors to running for their lives with their Commonwealth allies for a very good reason. Uh, Obviously, the German military was just all around better than the Italians. Can't say that enough. But uh, they also had another thing they had to worry about uh, when they were fighting the Italian Air Force, the Regia Aeronautica Italia. Was pretty much useless. Uh, the Greek Air Force, which was one step above biplanes, was able to fight them off without much of a problem. There was also a very limited British air support that they were able to give. The Italian Air Force was a non factor. Great. Uh, this is for a lot of reasons. This is hampered by local production and maintenance problems, like pretty much all of their other weapon systems. So the Greeks didn't have to worry about it. Their pilots were notoriously undertrained. Like, for instance, during their part in the Battle of Britain, they lost 36 planes. 26 of them were shot down on uh, by themselves or just, dro- <laughs> just dropped out of the sky on accident. Just turn friendly fire off. Yeah, that's what I do. With one simple hack. Uh, you want to know how many British planes they shot down? How are they? Zero. Not a single oh. one. <laughs> Bad day today. Bad day today. Zero thirty six. Truly the lions of air forces. See, now the German air force had entered the chat and uh, things were not going good. They had complete control of the skies ever since they invaded. A Times reporter said, quote, for two days, I have been bombed, machine gunned and shot at by all and sundry. German Stukas have blown up cars from under me and strafed a third. All day and all night, there's been waves of Germans in the skies. Luftwaffe commander in chief Hermann Goring must have had a third of his air force operating here and every and bombing every nook and cranny hamlet and village down its path. So, not shit left for the Greeks to do. And they, their anti-aircraft infrastructure was not enough to hold off uh, the the Luftwaffe at this point. Sure. One British unit refused to allow this routine to be you know disrupted. Uh, the the routine of like going about soldierly stuff. Jack and your own dick in a porta potty, yes. Yeah, Jack and your dick in a porta potty. Uh, the British version of that, which is stopping what they're doing and playing a game of soccer on the roadside. <laughs> Someone uh, noticed this and said, quote, the game is reaching its end of the first half when a dozen Stukas appeared over her head and started strafing a convoy moving across the road. Only a few yards away from the field. Nobody moved and the game continued on as the planes uh, bombed and strafed everybody. Players dribbled past and kicked the ball with unrelenting zest. <laughs> Some seriously Br- British energy there. Yeah. Well, you know, keep calm and, I don't know, ignore getting bombed. Keep calm and never win the World Cup at a game that you invented. Correct. <laughs> At this point of the war, it's been going on for about six months, uh, and the government was falling apart. The king had effectively taken complete and utter control of the government, and while that does sound bad, we are not, in fact, uh, in favor of absolute monarchies here. No. He had to do so because the prime minister, Koisis, was pretty useless, as we talked about in the last episode. He was a former bank manager with no political experience. Hard time for on-the-job training, uh, and he was mentally, literally unable to handle the job. He spent his time having mental breakdowns and panic attacks as the war began to turn against Greece and get worse and worse. I would too. And eventually, while sitting in his office one day, he shot himself in the face. Yeah, Uh, that's fair. The Greek press reported that he had died from a heart attack uh, in order not to freak out the public about their things are now so hopeless. The prime ministers are off themselves. Yeah, like things have to be going pretty bad here. This has been about six months of war and they've gone through two prime ministers. No job. Yeah, our is nice. (laughs) <laughs> now after hearing this general papagos reportedly turned to the, his british counterpart and said quote we are finished but the war is not lost therefore save what you can of your army and help and win elsewhere please leave greece <laughs> uh, what a bummer you did what you could kid we'll take it from here but that did not mean the greeks were tapping out they just simply accepted they were fighting a lost cause but god damn it they would fight that lost cause for as long as they could the Greek army in Albania was cut off by a German advance, pinning them against the Italians and the Germans on either side. Now out of ammo once again, because their supply system never improved. And they've been oh. fighting off like wave after wave of Italians for six months now. And they also like they weren't going to get ammo. They were scavenging right. everything from the Italians who also didn't have much. Not a recipe for success. For those of you wondering, it's not. It's not. It's the, if your army doesn't have bullets, they can't do army stuff. 
You can only sink your teeth into so many guys. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how to explain logistics easier than like if you don't give them food, water and bullets like you don't have an army. The general in charge of the uh, the Albanian front decided that he knew he had to surrender, but he wouldn't give the Italians the satisfaction. So he turned his army around, marched over to the Germans and surrendered instead. That's fantastic. I mean, and that sucks because they probably all got massacred. But Generally speaking, the Germans treated POWs at this point of the war okay. That's Your experience good. may certainly vary, however. They treated the Greek military all right. That would spiral wildly out of control as the war went on, of course. Especially if you have to be a civilian and say, Crete, but we'll get there. But uh, this pissed off Mussolini so bad, he bitched and complained to Hitler until Hitler ordered the German general to tell the Greek general to go and surrender to the Italian leader for a photo op before returning over to German custody. Oh, <laughs> that's embarrassing. That's tough, man. Can you imagine? Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, just go over there and uh, make this guy's day. He's a big fan. He always wanted to meet you, you know. This uh, this actually wouldn't be the last time the uh, the Germans would, would do something like this to make the Italians feel better. Now, at this point of the war, the king knew that shit was fucked. He and his cabinet fled mainland Greece aboard a uh, an RAF plane to Crete, oh. uh, the island off the coast. Yes. And uh, the no British... Had, is, I'm just saying some people might not. All right. That's fair. Sorry. Not Sorry, everybody, everybody who listens to the show uh, might have a great grasp of geography of some kind. I'm, I'm not sure. Now, the, the British headquarters in Athens also gave the order to evacuate, but an operation would have to be prepared in order to buy time for this evacuation to occur. So Wilson, old Jumbo, planned a final stand in a place pretty famous for final stands, Thermopylae. Thermopylae? Nice. <laughs> Now, unfortunately, modern warfare kind of makes ancient defense plans obsolete. You guys heard of this uh, graphic novel, 300? Guys, guys? Based on true facts, including all the mutants in it. Well, they all have to go home and win and fuck their wives. The British come back with this cup of tea or upon it. Go home and fuck the problem queen, baby. <laughs> now, uh... Instead of a romantic three-day-long last stand that the Spartans and their allied Greeks pulled off against the Persians. How long we got? The Commonwealth soldiers around this time could only hold for two days, oh. which was honestly what they needed. Like, I was they, kind of expecting six hours. So Yeah. Once again, the problem was very well-trained German mountain soldiers. They're like, yeah. let's just scale the cliffs and flank them. <laughs> Which is exactly what happened. Um, this ended up being something of an embarrassment for the Greeks because there was a last stand at Thermopylae and there actually were no Greek soldiers present. Uh, it's considered something of a, a sore mm. spot for a Greek mm. military history, or of at least the Hellenic Republic Greek history. Now, it wasn't from a lack of trying. The German tanks got their teeth kicked in uh, by Australian gunners. Uh, they, were, they were doing a lot of good work with their anti-tank guns, but like I said, you... Just climb the fucking mountains and you're fucked. Can I do so much, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it turns out they did not need a, a small, weird mutant to tell them how to <laughs> climb the mountains like they did in the movie. <laughs> now, at this point, every remaining unit began to break for the coast, setting fire to trucks and guns behind them in order to block the roads and slow down the advancing Germans. They moved only at night and to dodge the constant German airstrikes. And one British soldier said, quote, the brave Greek people were lining the streets and wishing us good luck as we went. It was terrible. It was like leaving a sinking ship with most of the passengers still on board. Oh, yeah, that, was, that can't feel good. They were only able to board ships and set sail for Crete on moonless nights. Now, there's a very good reason for that. The RAF doesn't exactly have a huge presence here to fight off the Luftwaffe. Like, it's one of those situations like, look, guys, you're kind of on your own. <laughs> sure. One Dutch group of ships decided that they didn't really need to wait for moonless nights. And uh, a ship and its two escorts decided to linger just a bit too long. Uh, and as dawn light filled the harbor, they are attacked by bombers, sinking three ships and killing 650 people. Fuck. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't fuck around when there's air power mm -hmm. around, man. Now, one escape route was the bridge at the Corinth Canal linking the Peloponnesus to the mainland. The Germans knew this and launched an airborne glider assault in order to capture what? it. Yeah, which like would have worked. Their timetable was just fucked up. Good. <laughs> Something that will become common as more German paratroopers enter the fray. Well, they all get stuck in trees and dead. 
And then the Greeks go home and fuck their wives. Something like that. Uh, now, this glitter attack would have worked, uh, but it ran a bit late due to weather, and Wilson and his soldiers made it across. And an Australian rear guard stayed behind to blow the bridge up. And uh, funny enough, when their detonators actually failed, uh, they were forced to t- take pot shots at the explosives until they went off. Oh, wow. Like Call of Duty. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly like a video game. And the one Aussie with good aim managed to hit it just as a German team was working to defuse the bomb, blowing them up in the process. Counter terrorists win. Yeah. <laughs> like, did you fucking see that? One shot, five Germans beat that. <laughs> 360 no scope. That's right. Next thing you know, he's going to sneak up behind him and knife him and then teabag the corpse. <laughs> Now, uh, with the Germans and technically, I guess, the Italians as well in control of mainland Greece, the Commonwealth and Greek forces numbering around 50,600-ish displaced to Crete, the, the, the largest island under Greek control. The British had begun to garrison the island and building airships months before, and uh, you know, it also supplied the British with a solid harbor for the Royal Navy. Sure. There's absolutely no way these forces are going to be able to retake the mainland, however. And at this point, the German high command is pretty goddamn busy planning a little thing known as Operation Barbarossa that was supposed to kick off not that much longer. They didn't actually worry about Crete. They knew that, like, well, they're fucking trapped there. They can't really do anything. Like, right. they're not going to invade Greece. But uh, something that will become pretty common among this and future series, Hitler disagreed. Uh, He was worried that the British aircraft based on Crete could bomb the Romanian oil fields, which were pretty obviously important for future operations, especially the invasion of the Soviet Union. Hitler was uh, under the impression that the Soviet Union was going to possibly invade them any day, uh, putting them on some kind of like time constraint. This is something that's pretty common for Hitler throughout World War Two. What? He was just about to get invaded by the Soviet Union? He always felt like he he had to act, uh, like he was always in a rush. Time was always against them, which, of course, eventually that really was true. But at the time, it absolutely wasn't. But you know, he believed in his own mind palace that the Soviet Union was going to invade Nazi Germany, which they absolutely were not. Um, Any day now. So in his mind, the, the British being on Crete was a serious threat to this whole Nazi world domination plan he had, uh, he had going on. Now, this wasn't something that could be allowed to stay for any length of time. It was an emergency and had to be taken out immediately, just like in his head, the Soviet Union was. And we saw how that ends. This began what would become known as Operation Mercury, a plan hated by everybody in Germany other than one guy, Kurt Student. Now, Student was a commander of the German paratroopers, the Fulschemjägers, uh, who Hitler was fucking in love with. Yes, this and, I know. Well, at least for now. <laughs> now this is because anybody who's dabbled in world war ii history stuff or listened to this podcast for any length of time knows that hitler is a huge fan of flashy shit and flashy but ultimately pointless shit especially Wunderwaffe. yeah uh so far in the war the paratroopers have shown themselves to be useful in german military operations they carried out uh airborne assaults uh Netherlands, uh, I think they did one in Denmark as well, but they were all very small scale. Uh, they were in support of other ground operations. We're not talking uh, Operation Overlord level paratrooper operations yeah. here. Right, 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 right. And they looked cool. They were Hitler's shock troops. They were go in, take airfields, things like that. Securing right. an entire island was not something that they had a plan for. Stun, on the other hand, was... Pretty confident. He sold Hitler on the idea to drop his paratroopers onto Crete and solve the whole goddamn problem within a day. Uh huh. So, of course, Hitler thought this is a great idea and greenlighted the attack, doing what he normally does of giving him only 20 days to plan the entire thing. That's fine. They only need one to win the, win the whole day. You said that. Exactly. His words. So, of course, this leads to all the problems. Um, for starters, Germany had been kind of fighting a war all over Europe for the last couple of years, uh, which put a ton of strain on their military infrastructure. A total of 500 transport planes would be required to transport the airborne troops into battle. These happened to be the same planes that had just been being run ragged throughout the wars in the mainland, like Greece, Romania, Yugoslavia, all of those places. And to make sure they didn't just fall out of the sky, they needed serious engine maintenance. So on May 1st, the entire fleet flew to a couple dozen aircraft maintenance facilities scattered all throughout Germany, Austria, those places to get maintenance. And by May 15th, 
only 493 of them would return ready to go. So oh. that's yeah, that's seven planes down already. Now remember, an airborne operation that's going to require multiple go rounds, which is never what you want to do. You want to drop them all at once. This is something right. we will we will revisit when we eventually talk about Market Garden, because you know there's a certain arithmetic that comes in airborne operations. You put planes and throw people out of those planes. Of course, a certain amount of those planes are going to be shot down. You no longer have those planes anymore. So that means every single train ride, you know, above the the fucking battlefield where you're going to throw people out of these things, you have less planes every go around, mm-hmm. which means you can bring less people, less supplies every go around. You see, you I see follow. one of the problems that's going to pop up. Congratulations, you're now smarter than Kurt Student. <laughs> Now, the next part of the plan will require the Germans to find a place suitable for hundreds of planes and thousands of men, since all of the nearby Greek airfields, you know, with paved runways, had been go- given over to bomber wings, which were like, you know, more important uh, mm-hmm. at the time. So the paratroopers would have to use fields and dirt roads. Oh. Now, these fields were ruddy messes and badly unlevel, so someone decided to plow the entire thing as an attempt to make them more level. Now, if anybody's ever been in the, in the middle of a dry field in a windstorm, you knows it's a really bad idea because it just turned everything to a choking mess of dirt whenever a plane actually used it. By some estimations, a dust cloud rose through 3,000 feet and made it impossible for formations to follow uh, each other uh, at intervals of any less than 17 minutes because it would have been too dangerous. So that means you now have fewer planes taking off with, with soldiers in them to drop on a target. That are further far apart, meaning every single stick, a stick being, you know, like a plane with soldiers that jumps out of it, is isolated immediately. <laughs> oh, good. Good time for some flack. For people who are unaware, a lot can fucking happen in 17 minutes of combat. <laughs> now, that was actually better than some airfields. Five of the German airfields were actually just sand. That sounds like it's just doomed for failure from the start. They had to lower the loads inside the planes to make sure they didn't sink in the sand. Gotcha. Which some did anyway. Uh, like their their landing gears would sink in and they just crash, or they'd crash upon takeoff or crash right. on landing. Uh, but now you have five airfields now operating with even fewer soldiers inside. Obviously, we need fuel for these. 493 planes to make an estimated three total trips, which of course would go up as they lost planes. That would be needed in order to make it rain Nazis. This is the worst weather. Yeah. Uh, it's literally raining men and I hate it. About a half a million gallons of fuel would be needed. As of May 17th, none had shown up yet. Now, this forced the invasion to be pushed back several days as a fuel ship docked and uh, 650,000 gallons of fuel are transported to the airships. One 45-gallon drum at a, of fuel at a time. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Unfortunately, uh, there's, remember, hundreds of planes. They don't have ground crews for all of these planes. Uh, so by the time the fuel actually arrived, the paratroopers would have to be the ones to unload it and pump it into the planes via hand-powered cranks, one barrel at a time again. This took forever. It took all fucking night. So by May 20th, when the invasion finally began, the paratroopers had all been awake for two fucking days doing ground crew jobs. Okay. You can sound like an eager and ready fighting force. I'd say no problem. You know we could fix that. Meth. Is it meth? Yeah. <laughs> it's meth. Now, I do have to point out, because someone will probably say it, uh, that, well, of course, they're doing Air Force stuff, working on the planes. Unlike a lot of militaries, the Fulschemakers are actually part of the German Air Force. They were not part of the Army. Mm. Um, like, you know, in the U.S., paratroopers are part of the Army. Uh, well, back then, so was the Air Force, for that matter. But, uh, like... The the full shoemakers full under full Air Force command. So, but still having them do ground crew shit is very stupid because it, you can't have good military operations if everybody's ripped out of their mind on uppers. As if that wasn't bad enough, let's take a look at how they're actually going to jump out of these planes because most people probably picture paratroopers like Banna Brothers or whatever other modern paratrooper thing that you've seen where you simply step out of the side of a plane when you're hooked up to a static line, which then pulls your chute as you're falling. Right. And that's still how paratroopers jump out today. Uh, Like, it's a very simple process that only really got some safety vibes added in a little bit later on. They had weight, Joe. That was true. That's how most paratroopers would jump most of the time. 
However, remember the date that we're talking about here. This is way before Overlord. This is before... Yeah. uh, Because Overlord would revolutionize airborne operations uh, as much as they're kind of anachronism these days. Back then, it proved the concept that airborne troops uh, really could work uh, in a large-scale battle. They had been used prior to that as well, obviously, in Italy. But uh, that was truly a proof-of-concept operation. It hadn't happened yet. So we're, we're still very much in the, it's not necessarily the crawl version, the crawl walk run phase of paratroop preparations. Mm-hmm. Certainly walk though, um, because slow walk, maybe a little teetering. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, like a, a baby with a he- their heads a bit too big and <laughs> kind of tottering mm-hmm. over a bit because the Germans had adopted the Soviet method of paratrooper operation, which Herman Goring, the head of the air force had seen it uh, during a practice run during his visits to the USSR when they were, when they were still friends. Um, the Soviet method was very crude, but it would work. This required paratroopers to climb out of the inside of the plane onto the roof of the plane, uh, walk down its wings, what? and then jump off. Oh. Uh, yeah. Okay. That is, that's not OSHA. Obviously, the plane would have to slow down a hell of a lot to do this, so you just don't get ripped off the top from speed. But they did have some planes converted to step out the side, but not enough. It was a mix of the two. Um, but, you know, they would have to slow down quite a bit to do this, making them a very easy target for anti-aircraft fire. There's another small problem with air paratrooper operations. Uh, the parachutes themselves were hilariously unsafe, even for the 1940s. Uh-oh. So for people who don't understand how parachutes work, you have risers, right? You can slip those risers and control it. Now, an American parachute in the same time frame, you could control it decently okay. Hmm. Like you could steer it to make sure you don't say run into trees, <laughs> Sometimes. bodies of water. Yeah, I mean, obviously shit happens, right? You get taken by the wind, you're fucked. Also, the origin of the song Blood of the Risers. What a hell yes. of a way to die. Yeah. Now, the German parachute re- included a single riser, meaning it was a dumb parachute. You could not control it whatsoever once you stepped out of the plane. So you were just going? <laughs> yeah, you were a slow-moving lawn dart. So you hoped that the the plane was over the right target area, and when you jumped, you would land in an open field. A lot of times it fucking happened. <laughs> Another problem, I know the list is getting quite long here, but this one's probably the most glaring. Because of the way they were deployed, they could not jump while carrying weapons. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> but you need those. Yeah, you need those to do war, right? Uh, now, unless you're an NCO or an officer who would jump holding a sidearm, most Folsham Jaegers jumped completely and totally unarmed outside of maybe a couple hand grenades and a knife. All the weapons were loaded into airdroppable canisters, which were thrown out of planes after the paratroopers, like catch type situations. Oh no. Now, as we just talked about misdrops of people, now I'll talk about misdrops of equipment, which happened a lot, especially because the wind happens to be very strong on islands. So weapons would be thrown out of planes and immediately get pulled elsewhere, leaving groups of paratroopers completely unarmed. <laughs> Not ideal, certainly. Now, good news, though, if you happen to be a Nazi paratrooper, and hopefully none of you are. Yeah, we can, we can hope. None of this is going to be a problem, because uh, according to the head of the German intelligence, the Abswehr, Admiral Wilhelm Canaris, this battle would be such a walk in the park that you didn't even need weapons. See, his intel said there's only 5,000 British soldiers stationed on the island. They did not have any support of any Greeks. And furthermore, the local Cretan population hated the Greek monarchy so much they would welcome the Germans with open arms. Gross. Now, here's the funny part. I said intelligence was so bad. Oh, good. That it started a rumor that continues until this day that Wilhelm Canaris was actually uh, purposefully trying to make Hitler fail. <laughs> And was one of the reasons why he was implicated in the July 20th plot to kill Hitler. <laughs> uh, Have you ever been so bad at your job they consider you a fucking traitor? <laughs> <laughs> Only twice, Joe. Now, there, there is some evidence that Canaris may have been in on the plot, but like this legitimately, this intelligence was so fucking bad that they considered that like he had to have done it on purpose. 
No, I promise. Just like gun to your throat. I promise. I'm just a moron. Yeah, I'm just stupid. I swear. Uh, but one part was true. The Cretan population did really not like the monarchy. However, like in our in our favorite uh, podcast theory of fuck that guy, they hated Nazis a whole lot more. Now, there's a good uh, possibility that the Cretans wouldn't have given a shit if the Nazis simply never invaded their island. I think that has a lot to do with it. It's like they have a very uh, strong streak of independence. Right. Um, they they consider themselves Greeks, but they're also Cretan, and this is their fucking island. Fuck off. That 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 kind of thing. Uh, so the second you start floating in from the sky, they're, they don't care like who a, you like are. A bunch of dicks. <laughs> yeah. Like if the British were there on their own without Greeks, this Greek soldiers, they probably would have got shot at too. <laughs> now, so with all those problems and fuck ups, the airborne operation began on dawn of May 20th and waves of transport planes began dropping paratroopers while gliders came sailing in to deposit more on the ground. And then shit immediately went wrong. The slow flying planes were massacred in the sky and the soldiers that actually managed to land were outnumbered because only 3000 would land. <laughs> Good. And remember, they're all high on meth, making even the most elite troopers pretty useless. <laughs> That's what you think. <laughs> yeah, right. And they were mostly unarmed uh, because a lot of their canisters misdropped right into nearby villages where the Cretans then grabbed the rifles and armed themselves. Good, good. Good job, Cretans. Now, rather than the 5,000 or so Brits, like Canaris said, that the 3,000 paratroopers would have to fight, remember, they're fighting... Of almost 56,000 soldiers in a very hostile population that immediately joined in uh, to fight the, the oncoming Germans. Uh, and the wind picked up, leading to a ton of mistrops of paratroopers, which is always common when you throw people out of planes on parachutes. Mm -hmm. Especially not very good parachutes. Yeah, especially when they cannot control said parachutes. <laughs> um so on a lot of occasions, these Germans would find themselves singled out or maybe in small groups, totally unarmed, dropping into Cretan villages where they'd immediately get bludgeoned and stabbed to death. <laughs> Good. Very happy to hear that. <laughs> uh, and also sometimes you know, the villagers would have guns that they would then shoot them and good stuff, you know. Good. Thanks, Crete. All power to the Cretan villagers. And remember, they only had 493 planes to start this whole thing. And that number rapidly went down with every sortie over Crete uh, as the Nazis rushed to get more reinforcements into the battle when uh, they realized that this might not be going so good. <laughs> Within the first few hours, the plan looked like it was going to fail completely and be one of the most disastrous airborne operations in history. And to be fair, it still kind of is. Even though they still they end up winning eventually, it still is one of the most fucked up airborne battles ever. For his Pyrrhic victory, but anything to you. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to argue if, if Market Garden was a bigger fuck up than this, but like numbers wise, this this one is uh, because Market Garden didn't destroy any future use of paratroopers. Right. <laughs> um, this did. So the full Schmiegers would just keep throwing themselves into the fire, but they would eventually run out of ammo. Uh, because like they just didn't have enough planes to drop both men and ammo because the planes were getting shot down. Right. Also, they were running out of paratroopers in the first place. <laughs> it's like, huh, we only brought a couple thousand of them. Where did all, all uh, our guys go? Spent uh, all these months training full Schmiegers and they all died in four hours. <laughs> now, the answer to this is stealing a bunch of Greek fishing boats, jamming them with soldiers and supplies and sending them towards Crete. Uh, this also happened to be when Germany actually turned towards Italy and asked for help, begging them to send their navy because it was nearby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now uh, who needs help? Yeah. Now who comes begging? The plan was to draw the British Royal Navy away so this convoy of fishing boats could be used as a, uh, for reinforcements. But Italy refused, which is funny uh, because this is still technically a place they claim power over. And this is their war. They started this war like, now nah, we're done. We, we have Rome or we have fucking yeah. Athens. Fuck you. We don't need Crete. See you, nerds. So the Germans decided to just try without naval cover, uh, sending the boats out at night. But these old fishing boats weren't exactly made for carrying thousands of men and ton of supplies. So they could barely putt along, getting blown off course by waves in the wind until the Royal Navy finally found them and chased them back to the mainland. Uh, the Germans tried again a few hours later, assuming... Certainly it'll work this time. 
Kind of. They're like, ah, the Brits probably wouldn't expect we'd do the same stupid fucking plan so close together. Uh, this turned into something uh, that the author of my source that I'm using a, uh, called a, quote, waterborne massacre oh. uh, that lasted two hours. Now, the only survivors of this convoy were Germans who decided to throw themselves overboard and swim back to the coast for safety, leaving 800 dead people behind them. <laughs> this did not stop the Germans from going for a hat trick, however, which was also turned back with hundreds of casualties. Now, at this point, the British got a little overconfident. So far, the German bombers had been so busy supporting the stranded paratrooper buddies on Crete, they had largely ignored the Royal Navy, which had been given kind of free reign, as, as we kind of just saw. So the British sent 14 ships around the north coast of the island. Uh, they were quickly found by hundreds of German bomber and fighter aircraft. Uh. And, you know, a chase ensued. They lost the ship Juno, while several others were damaged. This eventually included the battleship Warspit. Warspit? Warspit! What a name. Which was badly damaged and barely staying afloat. Seeing the constant aerial attacks, the British ships ran for the southwest away from Crete, but the Air Force chased them anyway, sinking the Greyhound. When several ships turn around and try to find survivors, the Gloucester was also sank. At this point, the surviving ships ran towards Alexandria, Egypt for safety, being attacked the entire way, also losing the ship, the Fiji. Oh, Fiji. It didn't matter what the British did. They were just like getting hammered because they kind of had let the Germans have total air superiority. And they were finding out that Air superiority really sucked being on the other side of. Uh, we can imagine. That's, that sounds like it sucks. And I mean, they do have anti-aircraft weapons on board, of course. But, you know, when you're constantly fighting off clouds of hundreds of aircraft, you burn through your ammo pretty quickly. Right. And that was happening. Their anti-aircraft guns, when the British Navy sent out a picket to do anti-aircraft fire, the admirals just straight up didn't know they are out of ammo. Wow. So there's like, uh, I guess by anti-aircraft, you mean team meat shield. <laughs> now, every ship they sent to create to support the defense was attacked, damaged, or sank. By 7 a.m. on May 23rd, what was left of the British Mediterranean fleet limped back to Alexandria. The fleet commander quit against explicit orders from London to defend the Cretan seas at all costs. But at this point, the fleet had lost a thousand men, and the remaining ships were out of ammo or damaged to the point of being combat capable. The Germans, as it turned out, had learned their lesson and not launched another fishing boat-based reinforcement convoy towards Crete. Damn it. I hate, I hate when Nazis learn their lessons. Fourth time's the charm sometimes. And, you know, if it takes you four times to learn your lesson, you're still a fucking dumbass. That's true. Words of wisdom from Lions Led by Dogs. <laughs> so they instead were forced to rely on the Luftwaffe again. They packed every plane they could with soldiers and flew them in, dropped them off at an airfield because they, again, had run out of paratroopers to throw out of them and nobody could jump anymore. But by now, the, the British and the Greeks on the island were left without air or sea power as the German Air Force began to just fully rain bombs on them at will. Despite this, the Greek soldiers in, in a particular command continued to fight with near suicidal tenacity. An, a Kiwi officer uh, named Howard Klippenberger noted that the I Greek soldiers, there. yeah, solid, uh, noted that the Greek soldiers were quote nothing more than malaria-ridden little chaps with only four weeks of service, which oh. was kind of true, but that didn't seem to stop them. The Greeks had long since run out of ammo, so they just attacked the Germans. Back with, to fighting. Kind of, yeah. The, they would uh, yeah. they would attack the Germans with whatever weapons they found. Most of the time, bayonets, knives, and axes. They would overrun them, steal their ammo, and fight a little bit longer until they ran out again and have to do it all over again. Now, I need to point out that this Greek staunch refusal to retreat has made everything that we're about to talk about next possible. Slowly, the island's Commonwealth defenders were pushed towards the eastern end of the coast. And at this point, Churchill was telling his leaders how important it was to hold Crete, while his military leaders were telling him that was no longer possible. So once again, the British began to plan an evacuation. And once again, they only really escaped uh, without it being a complete bloodbath or just massive amount of POW taking, like, say, Singapore, due to Hitler being an idiot. Thanks, the, Hitler. <sighs> I mean, there's one person you can depend on to constantly fuck up when the cards are down. It's Hitler, uh, which is good. Yeah, thank God for that. 
when the pace of the battle settled into the fact that the Germans knew they were going to win, uh, like there's no doubt it was only a matter of time, Hitler began to immediately pull assets away. Because remember, Germany is planning Barbarossa. It's not supposed to kick off in like two days now. It happens very, very soon. Uh, and he like that was already going to tax literally every everything that Germany could scrape the bottom of the barrel for. So before the battle in Crete is over, he's already pulling things away, meaning that the mm. Germans no longer have the air power needed to just like bomb the British evacuation force. And that's the only reason why the evacuation is able to succeed is because the Germans simply did not have enough planes left because uh, they can't fly around the clock. They need maintenance, they need fuel, they need right, bombs. Right. If they kept the full weight of the Luftwaffe there, it would have turned the evacuation to a fucking shooting gallery. Uh, though they did still manage to sink a destroyer called the Hereward uh, and damage several others, killing 800 more people. So, like, just imagine what they could have done with the, with the original amount of Luftwaffe they had. It would have been a fucking massacre. Now, after the Commonwealth forces that had evacuated, the city of Her- Heraklion, sorry, Greece, it's the capital of Crete, uh, fell. Now, this meant any further large-scale fighting was was pointless, and the organized Greek military finally surrendered. Though, again, many of them scampered off into the mountains to slowly form into a resistance that would continue pretty much, well, for way after the war. Unfortunately, there's a civil war next. Right, now, right. Mussolini's temper tantrum had started this entire war, cost Italy around 13,755 killed and 25,000 missing. You can assume a lot of those are dead. And you know, about double the amount of killed were wounded. Around 3,000 Germans died, and the paratrooper corps was so badly mangled by the clusterfuck that Hitler refused to greenlight any other airborne actions for the rest of the war, which means I think this is the last airborne operation that any German military has ever done. <laughs> now... In the opinion of his commander in chief, Field Marshal Walter von Brauschwitz. It's always Gen- good when it rhymes with Auschwitz. <laughs> That's never a good sign. Uh, he's the commander of the general staff and the commander of the general staff, General Oberst Franz Halder. The month spent conquering Greece and Yugoslavia fatally delayed the invasion of Russia. Quote Had Hitler not run a swastika up on the Acropolis, he may have succeeded in draping one upon the Kremlin. Hmm. I personally don't believe that. Uh, but he certainly wouldn't have gotten his ass kicked so hard by the Russian winter. Um, this is again playing into the if Hitler didn't do this, the war would have ended differently thing. That sure. is never true. Germany was always going to lose. I don't know how many times I can point this out. But it just made the loss a lot harder. <laughs> now, speaking of the Acropolis in Athens, when uh, soldiers finally came to run the swastika up the Acropolis, a Greek soldier ran down the Greek colors, put them in his pocket, and then leaped to his death rather than hand them over. Admittedly, pretty badass. Yeah, it's some metal shit right there. Uh, I mean, you can just go down to where the body is and just like pickpocket them if you really want. I don't know. Uh, I'll say that. <laughs> I hope they didn't happen. Like, we have to respect his final wishes. <laughs> uh, now, Mussolini finally got his triumphant victory parade through Athens. Now, Funny story about this. He didn't win. The The Nazis did. So the Nazis also took part in this victory parade, right? Uh, Greek citizens actually showed up and uh, somebody commented that uh, that they only clapped for the Nazis so the Italians could see them clap for the Nazis. And then when they didn't clap for the Italians <laughs> and like greet them, like it, they literally like ghosted them they they watched the german soldiers march by clapped at them like half-heartedly and then immediately turned around and went home as the italians came by <laughs> as like one final fuck you which is just incredible now unfortunately the occupation of greece was terrible uh i can't go into it enough it's it's literally a topic uh for a different episode especially the greek resistance uh the germans plundered greece of food and medicine uh, paratroopers, regular soldiers, and death squads all carried out mass executions across the country. Uh, like the paratroopers themselves often uh, lumped in with the clean Wehrmacht shit, uh, right. just wiped out entire Cretan villages, is ugly shit. Um, the Holocaust destroyed 80% of Greece's Jewish population as well. Wow. Yeah. It's fucking awful. Uh, like the, the Germans picked Greece so clean of material, like food and, and medical uh, supplies. That 100,000 Greeks died of starvation and disease in Athens Jesus alone. Christ. Yeah. And, and these situations, the puppet government, 
uh, uh, infighting amongst resistance groups over what Greece would look like next led directly to a civil war, uh, which would kill 100,000 more people over the next couple of years. So that's the episode. Uh, sorry. sorry. But I mean, like, we can take small joys and the, the shit didn't go down easy. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is that. It's not often that a small nation that everybody believes is going to be a speed bump on the road to like a global empire savages you so hard you cancel an entire military concept for all eternity. Mm-hmm. But that is the Greco-Italian German war. It's mostly known as the Greco-Italian war for some reason, even though, even though it shouldn't be. Yeah, if, if, there was the, if this was truly the Greco-Italian War, it would have ended with Rome being occupied by Greece. <laughs> I have no fucking doubt. See how you like it. Yeah, but that's our, our episode. Uh, now, Liam, we do a little thing on the show, Good Questions from the Legion. Uh, if you'd like to ask us a question from the Legion, uh, donate to the show. Uh, any amounts, you uh, slide into my DM, send me an email, ask me a question on Patreon or the Discord. Wrap up your question in a small tight square, put it in your pocket and jump off the Acropolis and I will read it on air. If you're in Greece, don't do that. <laughs> don't jump off the Acropolis. <laughs> this one's kind of topical. Uh, I have two of them just to be safe. Are you a Warhammer 40k fan? Uh, I used to be into 40k, but that was about a decade ago. Perfect. And you know enough to answer this question. Mm-hmm. If you were forced to be in a Warhammer 40k military unit, any military unit, what would it be? I assume this means like any aliens, space marines, I guess is an easy cop out answer. Um, I'll tell you, Joe, I, I would want to be a space marine because I would I would I would I would want to be doom guy. No, it's a hundred percent like legit because everybody else's existence in Warhammer 40k is hell. <laughs> I'd be a space marine. Sorry, everybody. I've never actually played Warhammer 40k. I never played any of the uh the figurine or Tabletop, uh, table. Someone's gonna be really mad. I call it figurines, I guess. Um, but I've never played tabletop Warhammer 40k. I simply could never afford it, and now that I can, I don't have time for it, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but uh, I love Warhammer 40k fiction. Like the lore is ridiculously, uh, it's like over the top entertaining, uh, and I love the books. So mm-hmm. I would a hundred percent have to say I would be in the Imperial Guard, Tanith first and only. Uh, and if you like 40k or you like military sci-fi fuck if you liked my books this is like the series that's heavily inspired me go read dan abnett's Tanith series it's so fucking good um it's called gaunt's ghosts i cannot recommend it enough there's like 15 books now plenty of entertainment but liam thank you for joining me in another duology you're welcome i promise the next series we cover will be significantly more hopeless and longer uh, because you picked it, and this is your fault. Uh, First, <laughs> and until next time, everybody. Thank you for uh, listening. Thank you for supporting the show. You seriously do. You make everything we do possible. Um, check out our Teespring store. I put new designs on there. I always freaking forget to point that out. Hey, you remembered? Yeah, once every ten episodes. It's like once a month. I remember that we have a whole yeah. ass store. Um, check out Liam's other podcasts. Well, there's your problem and ten thousand losses. Uh, and Buy my books. Did I miss anything? Am I good? Did I do Did I do my job as a guy yeah, who, who pays it. my you bills with this? Okay. And again, we will talk to you next time.